Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed we do. Tomorrow, you might be aware. Big day. Big day, midterm elections. So we have every indicator that we could find mm -hmm. about how this thing might go. We've got the ones that are good for the Republicans. We've got a few stragglers that are still good for the Democrats. We're going to go through all of them, and then you can make of it what you will. Um, we also have some footage from on the ground at those rallies. Our friend Jordan Sheridan over at Status Quo gathered some footage for us. So we're hearing from regular voters what they think about the race in Pennsylvania in particular. Um, at the same time, 2024 is already kicking off. Uh, rumors that Trump is set to launch his campaign basically imminently. Next week. Um, taking a few shots at Ron DeSantis and a preview of potential things to come. So that is very interesting as well. We've got new moves from Elon Musk and whatever the hell is going on at Twitter. We also have a report that the Biden administration is actually encouraging Zelensky and the Ukrainians to keep the door open mm -hmm. to negotiations and diplomacy. This, of course, comes on the heels of that progressive letter that was retracted, and it was a whole thing, so very interesting developments there. We also have some developing liberal cope <laughs> as the midterm elections seem to be not panning out, so some interesting explanations of exactly what went wrong for them. Uh, we are also going to go ahead and do the most foolish thing possible, which is to make our very specific specific predictions, which I'm sure will be completely wrong when we actually get the That's numbers in to tomorrow, do, but what the hell? Yeah. Why not? Let's go ahead and get started on the midterms. Let's throw our beautiful midterm graphic up there. It's been a while since we've seen it. The road, road to, to nowhere. nowhere. So what we <laughs> thought is that we would give the two <clears throat> cases here, which is that opening case is the case for a red wave. You know, we've gone over polling, we've gone over corrections, we've gone over what the last poll said. Is it going to turn out? Here is our best case uh, for the GOP. Let's go ahead and put this up there on the screen. The very final poll by Emerson College. Arizona, they have Blake Masters for the first time rising up against Mark Kelly. 48% to Mark Kelly's 47.7%. That is still razor tight and obviously within the margin. But if you assume, you know, some sort of red wave scenario, not difficult to see Masters winning by one or two points. Pennsylvania, a Dr. Oz can, can maintaining the one-point lead that he generally has had in the latest polling averages there in the state of Pennsylvania. Oz at 48, Fetterman at 47. Nevada, this one is actually a little bit more interesting given what we're going to talk about later in the show. They have Adam Laxalt at 51% and Catherine Cortez Masto at 46%. And then finally, Wisconsin, this one's actually a little bit more of a foregone conclusion though. Yeah, they have Ron Johnson at 51% and Mandela Barnes at 46%. Let's go ahead and throw the next one up there on the screen, which is that the 538 polling average continues to drift very much in the direction of Democrats. We should all remember, what was it? At, well, or sorry, of the Republicans. At one point, Crystal, what was it, like 75, 25? 70, I think 71 or 72 right. was as high as Democrats went. But yeah. it was like a near, you know, that's getting pretty close to the yeah. orders of a, right. Yeah. Exactly. And so now <laughs> we are at what? 54 to 46. So over 50% chance in the 538 and the, You got to be unhappy if you're Democrats with the trend. Yes. Because, yeah, what you want to see in the final days is things moving your way, mm -hmm. not just sort of steadily, consistently drifting towards your opponents. And I think and that's it's actually what you see. I think it's worth going down, you know, kind of race by race. The reason why that they have it that way is because they have Walker and Warnock actually more trending in the GOP favor mm -hmm. than Pennsylvania does. So oh, they have it. Yeah, they have it 57 out of 100 percent chance that Walker is going to win in Georgia. But they have Fetterman up very slightly at 54 to 100. However, uh, Adam Laxalt, they have at a 57% chance of winning. Mark Kelly, they have at a 65. Maggie Hassan, right now, they have at 73. But we need to specially highlight that race just because things have tr things have shifted so far in Brian Bolduc's direction in the last couple of days that it really is. And also, they have no early voting in the state of New Hampshire. It's one of those. Oh, I uh, didn't realize. Yeah, that. I didn't either. And That's so it's one of those, you know, truly on the day of will determine determine mm. what it is. And that's actually genuinely to the Republicans' benefits. A lot of the latest polls there even have either have it dead even, Bryant Bolduck up one, or Maggie Hassan up by two. So to have it very, very tight in the latest days there makes it so that that could be a real surprise on election night. I mean, obviously, there's a, some other crazy scenarios and like a total, total red wave you could consider, I mean, they say Colorado, and I, I don't think it's going to happen personally, mm -hmm. but I yeah. think we're, gen if there is the red wave, uh, I, I don't know, I'm curious what you think. I think 53 seats would be a quote unquote red wave. I that agree. Would be, yeah. That would I mean, be a that big would be pick up for Republicans. Basically, they win all the jump balls, right. Right. effectively, would be it, for them to get to 53. And I mean, I, so the latest polls out of New Hampshire, just to um, to underscore that, the 
most recent one was American Greatness Insider Advantage, which Insider Insider Advantage, I don't know, is that a Republican leaning American pollster? Greatness is. American, American Greatness, greatness is. is. Yeah. So they have ha- has, uh, Hassan up yeah. one. University of New Hampshire, Hassan up two. Daily Wire Trafalgar was the most recent one that has the Republican Bulldog up by just one. So, I mean, we're talking about either way, very, very narrow margins in that race at this point. I mean, I think basically the Republican theory of the case is that, and and this was laid out in a New Yorker article, we can go ahead and put this up on the screen of like what the insiders, the Republican insiders, who are at least telling journalists that they expect a blowout and they expect a red wave, the case they're effectively laying out here is like, look, yeah, abortion was really bad for us when it happened, Mm -hmm. but Democrats went all in on that messaging, and they didn't realize that the impact of that would fade over time. So what they say here is basically like, we didn't figure out a way to neutralize that issue, we just waited it out. And so as that has faded in importance, and Republicans have come on strong with you know crime ads, and especially hitting you know on the economy and inflation, and Democrats really didn't respond on those issues much at all, that's why you see this late shift towards the GOP and why Democrats in this scenario are in a lot of trouble. I mean, I thought it was interesting too, Sagar. They were talking about some of the polling because you guys will remember. I mean, back when the 538 uh, average had the Dems chances of taking the Senate at like 71, 72 percent, that was when Fetterman was up by double yes. digits. Yes. I mean, certainly Maggie Hassan was in no danger whatsoever. You had Mark Kelly up by double digits. You had Warnock with a smaller but consistent lead at that point. Well, what they're arguing is actually you had this response bias in the polls at that point, because after Roe versus Wade is overturned, you have a lot of liberals who are eagerly answering the phone to respond to these polls. And you had a lot of Republicans who were kind of sitting on their hands, not answering the phone. And so now as you get closer to election day, it's not even so much that the landscape has really shifted, but the polls are reflecting a more accurate sample of who the voters are actually going to be on election day. So um, they have this... uh, They have this quote here. They say the reason that Democrats have fucked this up is that they won't stop talking about abortion. And the reason they screwed it up with blacks is they won't stop talking about abortion. (laughs) It's like they're a two issue party. It's this and Trump. They can't stop. I don't think they have anything else. Um, And, uh, you know, to me, that's a pretty compelling theory of the case. Not an unreasonable uh, summary, I think, of what's going on here. I mean, I actually, to their credit, you know, there was an insider here that actually just put it very succinctly without any of the general general talking points. Inflation is the big federal story. Lots of blame belongs to the White House because the White House just wished this would go away yeah. instead of saying, we know it's real. We know it's a problem. It's happening everywhere. We're going to do everything to fix it, but we can't fix it immediately. Not a bad case, right? I mean, that is one of those that I really love seeing because it's devoid of the public rhetoric of like, oh, it's the spending or whatever. Like, look, we can have that debate another day. I think that that lands very effectively in the environment where the White House is basically saying we live in the greatest economy since World War II. And most people are like, well, I can't really pay my bills. Whenever you have a story that affects every single person in the United States, that by definition is going to be the most potent one that's going to be in the election. And actually, it's really interesting when you look at rankings of uh, what people find important, even on culture. So we were talking about Arizona, right? Well, number one, or number two, is not abortion. It's crime and immigration. Mm -hmm. Uh, Three is abortion. So that, again, this is the difficult thing. Yes, it matters. Uh, To many people, however, crime and immigration, especially in many of the swing states, are above abortion in the preferences of the general voters, especially of the independents. And then you add inflation on top of that, which is really just the trump card for the Republicans in this election. I thought there was an interesting point here made as well that they basically said um, Democrats got caught in what they described as an informational doom loop where in the wake of Roe versus Wade being overturned, they're getting all of these phenomenal poll results. You have those couple of special elections that we covered that it's like, holy shit, this is a bigger issue than we Mm -hmm. thought. And because of that, they decided we're going whole hog, we're doing nothing but abortion, we're all in on that. And they never adjusted from that as the polls started to move away from them. And the salience of that issue and the shock of that initial decision started to wear off over time. So because they'd gotten such a strong response in the early days, they thought, oh, this is this is the way, this is the winner. And you know, in fairness, I think 
listen, normally when you see these kinds of economic numbers, right track, wrong track numbers, low presidential approval rating, forget it. It's a done deal. Yep. It's a red wave. It's over. So abortion has kept them somewhat in the game. But they had this theory of like, the issues that we think are bad for us, we're just not going to talk about, and we're going to per- we're going to try to shape the issues that are defining this election. We want the issues to be basically abortion and like extremism, democracy, January sixth, that sort of stuff. Well, when you have voters over and over and over and over again saying like that's nice that those are important to you, and we're not saying they're not important, but we really care about the economy. This is really important to us. And by the way, we do also care a lot about crime and feeling safe like in our neighborhoods and our homes. You can't just wish cast your narrative of the election onto the electorate. I think they had every opportunity to rebut the Republican talking points on inflation. I think the Biden administration had every opportunity to talk about corporate price gouging and really call executives onto the carpet and really make that a focal point and a centerpiece of the campaign. And yeah, structurally, it would still have been difficult for them because they're the party in power and things aren't going well. And so people are going to say you're to blame. But if you could even eat into the Republican margin on the economy and on crime where you could make a compelling case like, hey, these these people are out like flooding our streets with with guns and allowing illegal guns to flow. And that's part of the crime problem. but But at least you would have. At least you would have something to say. Instead, they do this on on these issues. They do this, you know, they did the same thing on CRT. They do the same thing on um, the the fights over uh, transgender issues in public schools. Instead, they just want to say like, ah, we're just not going to talk about that and hope that it ultimately goes away. I think the lesson here is that, especially in the current media environment, and especially as effective as Republicans are at focusing these issues and putting them on the table, you can't afford to just completely cede the issue to the other side. You have to at least have your own narrative around it, at least be messaging on it and try to eat into their lead on those issues. Yeah, I think it's possible. Although I'm not so sure. I mean, to be honest, like even when they do try and justify their uh, positions, they're frankly even more popular when they don't talk about it, which is generally why they don't. I mean, on- Im- What do you mean? Well, especially on, uh, on some of the cultural issues, like the crime. I mean, the the guns argument you made, that's Eric yeah. Adams' uh, position in New York. He's got a historically low a rating on crime. So it's not like it actually works. Same with the other cultural issues that you mentioned. Like, honestly, when they do admit what they want, like, it just makes it more popular, which is why they generally ignore well, it. I so, think like, you could have framed crime very yeah. much as an issue. Like, the voting public is much more on Democrat side on guns. Like, the Republican position on guns is really extreme. And so at least then you have a competing theory of the case of why crime is high and what Democrats will do to make you feel safer. I just don't think that you can say, like, ah, we're just going to not talk about this and hope people don't notice. Same thing, inflation is really clear to me. Like, this is the number one issue. If there is a red wave, it's because of the economy, bottom line. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think that was really clear. I think that was the case with Glenn Youngkin, even though there were also cultural issues that were relevant and very motivating to the base there as well. You can't just hope that people aren't going to notice they can't pay their bills and inflation is still high. You can't just like pray that people aren't going to realize that their budgets are stretched thin and they're like basically getting a pay cut every single week. That is not going to work out. So again, I think it would be difficult for them to win economic voters, but because abortion is a salient issue, because you have a cast of characters on the Republican side that's like insane, psycho, where do they even find these people, that would have at least kept them in the game. And I think there is a compelling case that they could make that they just decided instead to bury their heads in the sand and be like, no, actually the economy's great. Yeah, that's fair. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.